Let's move on to some pericyclic reactions. Now, pericyclic reactions occur without any intermediates, all right, whether they're ionic or radical. These are concerted reactions. One step, reactants to products, no intermediates. There are three types of uh, pericyclic reactions that we're going to learn. Cycloaddition are the first ones. Uh, cycloaddition occur uh, with three curved arrow mechanisms. And what really happens is one pi bond, what happens is one pi bond will break and attack uh, another sp2 hybridized atom. The pi bond there will break and attack another sp2 hybridized atom. And then the pi bond will break. It's this rearrangement of three pi bonds, okay? And those three pi bonds are going to be what um, actually rearrange to form, let's highlight what we formed, a new sigma bond from this rotation and two new sigma bonds. So overall, two pi bonds overall net react and two new sigma bonds form, right? Because we still have one of the three pi bonds left over. These cycloaddition is what we're gonna start with. Um, in, in this section, uh, Diels-Alder reactions are the, the reaction that we're going to work with. Let's move on and see the other two types of cycloaddition reactions first before we get into the nitty gritty of the Diels-Alder. All right, so uh, electrocyclic reactions. Um, these reactions occur with, again, three curved arrows, one pi bond, will go and make a sigma bond and the other two pi bonds rearrange, okay? So overall, we are getting this new pi bond or this new sigma bond okay, to be formed and the rearrangement of the other two pi bonds. Lastly, we have our sigma tropa tropic rearrangements. Uh, these rearrangements make a new sigma bond, but break a sigma bond as well. So as we see these rearrange, one sigma bond breaks, a new sigma bond forms, and then a pi bond can shift over. This is the new sigma bond. This is a new pi bond. And this pi bond simply just shifted over. We'll practice more in depth with all of these pericyclic reactions, but this is just a brief introduction to show you how the curved arrows are involving that cyclic style uh, transition state um, that could result in different pi bonds and sigma bonds in the outcome. The reaction mechanisms are all concerted, um, so there are no intermediates. Uh, these mechanisms do involve a ring of electrons moving around a closed loop, which is what we're calling the transition state being cyclic. Um, and the polarity of the solvent generally has no effect on the reaction rate. Uh, transition state has little, if any, charge. There's a great uh, table in your textbook, table 16.1, that is uh, looking at the number of uh, sigma bonds or pi bonds changing. Right? So if we're adding sigma bonds, like in our deals alder, our cyclo addition, which we'll talk about uh, in just a few moments, uh, we are adding two new sigma bonds and removing two of the pi bonds. Uh, the electrocyclic adds one new sigma and it removes uh, one pi. The sigma tropic, there's no net change uh, in sigma or pi, it's just the rearrangement itself. So let's talk about the deals alder. Deals alder are very, very useful. Uh, not only are they concerted, which is great, uh, they actually form a six-membered cyclohexene ring. It's what we call a 4-2 cycloaddition. Why four? Because we have a diene, which has four carbons, and we have our dienophile. 
Now, a dienophile is a dying lover, right? File is uh, our root for love. And so this dienophile is really looking to react with our dying and what comes out of it is a six membered ring. Now I'm going to uh, number these five and six, just so that we can see the six membered ring form, but hopefully you know where that two comes from. It's from the dieno file itself. Curved arrows again, one more time. Doesn't matter which way around the ring you're gonna go, but we should start at one pi bond and push clockwise or counterclockwise. Again, cycloaddition, like all of our pericyclic reactions, they occur in a ring style transition state. So they don't really matter uh, which way you're flowing, clockwise or counterclockwise. We have two new sigma bonds, right? To make the six membered ring. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And the double bond is there in between carbon two and three now. So again, like all pericyclic reactions, the mechanism is concerted and the curved arrows can be drawn clockwise or counterclockwise. I'll draw them again this way just to show you the difference. That would be clockwise on the bottom, counterclockwise on the top. Same two sigma bonds forming. Same product. All right. Beautiful. Now, in terms of the uh, reaction coordinate diagram, this reaction is generally exothermic. Um, and so, and we'll talk about why. Um, thermodynamically, they're favored at low temperatures or moderate temperatures. Um, we can get a retro Diels Alder reaction. These can be reversible, but what we do see is that typical uh, product is uh, more stable. Uh, here is the idea of the forward and the backwards. Retro deals alter can be uh, happen can occur um, at high temperatures above 200 degrees Celsius, um, and that is predominantly because of entropy. Now, when we're looking at uh, this reaction, let's just remind ourselves of thermodynamics. Uh, Delta G, spontaneity, is composed of two different factors, enthalpy and entropy. So when we're thinking about enthalpy, delta H, right? Let's just think about delta H real quick. That is when we talked about bonds breaking and bonds forming, right? Bond breakage requires energy, bond forming releases energy. We have three pi bonds in the reactants. We have two new sigma bonds and one pi bond in the products. There is more stability in sigma bonds. And so therefore, when we make sigma bonds from pi bonds, we actually are exothermic. Sigma bonds are more stable. And so when we look at this product, uh, the fact that we are forming new sigma bonds from these pi bonds. Uh, pi bonds are easy to break, sigma bonds are harder, right? Sigma bonds are more stable. And so that, therefore, we see that uh, energy is released as a um, product for enthalpy. Now, in terms of entropy, delta S, right? Remember, delta S is looking at uh, order microstates options, right? Um, disorder is sometimes used as well. But I like thinking about microstates. I like thinking about flexibility, movement. Um, when we see two reactants come to make one product, this is a decrease in spontaneity a, or a decrease in entropy. This decrease in entropy uh, results in a negative delta S. So combining these two terms, we are unfavorable for entropy, but favorable for enthalpy. This is how we get our temperature dependence. When we look and put this into our calculation, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. The entropy term is overall 
positive, the enthalpy term is overall negative, so we can go either way with spontaneity, right, with delta G. So for the Diels-Alder reaction, the enthalpy term must be larger than the enthalpy entropy term because of uh, the idea of delta G being negative to be spontaneous. At very, very high temperatures, the entropy term is larger than the enthalpy term. And so therefore the reaction would not be spontaneous. So ideal temperature is typically between room temperature and 200 degrees Celsius, which is relatively hot, but uh, that's usually the kicking point to where we would get the retro deals all to the reverse happening. So the reactants are called the diene and the dienophile. There's your curved arrow mechanisms. Let's talk specifically now about what types of dienes and dienophiles we uh, can have. The dienophile actually needs to possess an electron withdrawing group. If it doesn't have something that's making it more delta plus, an electron withdrawing group, remember, is something that would pull away electron density. It needs to have something on it that wants to pull away the electron density from this dienophile. Remember, this guy is our dienophile. The alkene, if you will. Um, if it doesn't have a withdrawing group, then the temperature needs to be at the very, very peak of favorability here. Um, and it's really, really hard to, to get any product out of this. What do we mean by a dienophile? Something like a carbonyl or another pi bond from a, the cyano group, right? Uh, so the nitrile. When we're looking at why these are, are um, electron withdrawing groups, remember this is a polar bond, delta minus on the oxygen, delta plus on the carbon, the carbon being directly connected to that dienophile makes it a good electron withdrawing group. All of these factors down here, ketones, esters, carboxylic acids. Uh, if you want to remember what the cyano group is or the nitrile group, It's a carbon triple bonded to a nitrogen. Again, delta plus and delta minus. So again, an electron withdrawing group. All of these are good electron withdrawing groups and they should be at least one of them present on our dienophile. We could have more than one on our dienophile, right? We could have stereochemistry to this dienophile. We could have cis or trans, or what we um, specifically would call Z or E. Remember, Z or E come from the German for together or opposite. Together, azusamen, uh, cis, or E entigen, which is opposite in German. Those were uh, the, in the language of those developed, the stereochemistry of alkenes. Uh, if you want to remember cis and z, just remember my favorite German accent, z same side, z same side, okay, yep. Uh, with this deals alder reaction, because the reaction is concerted, we do have stereoselectivity. So the actual reaction, when we have stereochemistry to our alkene, will create a stereospecific reaction. Notice here, the cis conformation, the Z conformation of our dienophile creates the cis conformation of our cyclohexene at the end of the day. If we have a trans dienophile, we get trans for our cyclohexene. Now, why do we have a plus EN over here, but not on the first one? Be very careful with meso compounds. If those two electron withdrawing groups on the dienophile in the Z conformation are identical, 
you will get a meso compound. If they are different, then you will get enantiomers, a mixture of enantiomers. Um, so be very aware meso compounds could occur with a Z conformation dienophile if the dienophile is symmetrical, okay? Now the alkyne can also function as a dienophile. Let's go through that curved arrow mechanism. One pi bond breaks and we get the cycloaddition. One pi bond is still staying present, all right? So you don't see any wedges or dashes for those two ester groups because that uh, dienophile was sp hybridized and now it is sp2 hybridized. All right, before we had sp2 hybridized dienophiles and now we're sp3, which is why we get wedges and dashes, okay? Uh, let's talk about the diene real quick. The diene, as we talked about at the very beginning of this chapter, can exist as an S cis conformation or an S trans conformation. Deal alders only work if the actual diene can form the S cis conformation. There's that almost cyclic conformation, right? The S trans won't work. So if you are locked in an S trans position as a, a diene, you will not undergo a Diels alder. Let's look at that right here. One, two, three, four. Because it's an exocyclic structure where the, the last pi bond there is heading out of the ring and one is in the ring, uh, there is no way to become S cis here. So no reaction, right? The one and four carbons are way too far apart. Now, Dienes that are locked in the S cis conformation, locked in that S cis conformation, like cyclopentadiene here, uh, actually undergo Diels alzers really, really fast. Uh, they are a lot better as dienes because they're already in the S cis conformation. We talked about the S cis versus the S trans and said S cis is higher in energy, right? So if a molecule, a diene has the ability to do both S cis and S trans, it will work for Diels alder, but it will be really, really slow because it has to first form into that S cis conformation and then undergo the reaction. If the diene already exists in the S cis and it's locked in that conformation, so much better for us. Cyclopentadiene actually is so reactive towards Diels alder that it will actually react with a, a version of itself, right? So let's just count this out. One, two, three, four, five, and six of another cyclopentadiene. So the cyclopentadiene actually gets to be not only the diene, but also the dienophile. And so when it reacts, this little, I'm gonna star that carbon, he becomes what we call a bridge, right? Here are the two new sigma bonds that were formed, one, two, three, four, joining carbons five and six, right? Very, very weird to draw, but we will be practicing these bridged bicyclic molecules. Let's just take a moment to start to practice real quick. Uh, you wanna form what looks kind of like an envelope shape, okay? So two uh, parallel lines slanted downward to the left and join them, and then two slanted lines downward to the right and join them, and then that bridge up top. If this is a product of cyclopentadiene and a Diels alder, you will also have an alkene on the left-hand side. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right, there's that little bridge that we had. To draw the rest of the cyclopentadiene, uh, notice we're just pointing these down and trying our best for the rest of it, all right? We'll practice a lot together in class. Cyclopentadiene, though, is a very interesting uh, diene to use um, because of that bridge. There are two ways that a diene, a file, can react with uh, that cyclopentadiene. Um, and it's because of the bridge that we want to really talk about this uh, a little bit more in depth. 
So this is the Z confirmation or the cis, right? So we should expect um, the, the products were those CHO groups. These are aldehydes. That's the um, condensed formula for an aldehyde. When these react, Uh, those CHO groups will, could either be both pointing down or both pointing up. This is not a meso compound anymore because of the bridge. So be very careful. Don't be like, I thought, Lauren, there was a bridge. Uh, yes, but the bridge um, prevents the meso compound from actually occurring, right? You can't just flip this over and superimpose it as a meso compound. There's no more plane of symmetry. Um, but which one of these is better, right? Which one of these is more stable? Well, when looking at these two, um, what is really uh, interesting is that the bridge itself with that one carbon atom right there is creating, no, don't forget the hydrogens attached there too, is creating um, more bulk on the top side of this structure. And so what we call exo on that same side wedged is um, very, very close to that large bridge. Um, and endo, which we are calling pointing down, is uh, a little bit smaller, right? And so looking at these, I kind of want to draw these real quick in its planar conformations so that you can see the bridge wedged on top. CHO, CHO, this is endo. And then we'll draw exo with those CHO groups on the same side. Now you can kind of visualize that a little bit better too if you're more into the wedges and dashes. Uh, the bridge is wedged, it's up on top. That's just how we usually denote it. Um, and so having those aldehyde groups also wedged uh, starts to imagine some steric hindrance. There's another favorability to uh, the dashed aldehydes, the endo conformation as well. And we'll talk about that in terms of the transition state. Uh, why do we call them exo and endo? Yeah, I don't know why, but here's what I have come up with. You know me, you know that I always come up with some funky way of remembering. This kind of looks like a house to me, you know? There's your front door, there's your window. Probably like, is she really doing this right now? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I am. Endo the house. You're in the house, exo the house, you're exiting the house, you're coming out of it. <laughs> nice, okay. Now, uh, endo is technically the major product. Endo is a better conformation to be in. Why? Not only because of steric hindrance of the bridged position, but also there is a favorable interaction between the developing pi bond and that of the electron withdrawing substituents. This is the developing pi bond right here in between carbons two and three, right? And this pi bond of the electron withdrawing group is overlapping. And so their p orbitals are actually in a favorable position. And that is when we create the endo, uh, endo uh, final product. So this endo final product is major no matter what the diene is, it is going to be the major product. When we start seeing that uh, developing pi bond um, with the exo position, it's way too far away. The pi bonds of um, exo conformation transition states are actually too far apart. So this is always the minor. There's nothing stabilizing that molecule's transition state at all. And there's the energy diagram to visualize that. Yeah, XO might be a little bit lower in energy because it's outside of this house and those two groups are not technically eclipsing any other hydrogens or any other groups, um, but they are much higher in uh, transition state.
Okay, so we've been dealing with uh, dienes and dienophiles that are symmetrical, at least something is symmetrical. If one of the molecules, the diene or the dienophile is symmetrical, then there, there's only one product, regiochemically, right? There's no right or wrong way then to, to count up your atoms and to combine them, right? Because you're going to get the same thing no matter what. If you have a diene and a dienophile that are both unsymmetrical, then technically you will get two constitutional isomer products, regioisomeric constitutional isomers. There's two different ways to count up these carbons, right? The two different ways are what we draw here, this guy, or I'm just gonna flip it so that we can see what I mean. One, two, three, four, five, six, this guy. Which way? Which one do we use? How do I know this is major versus minor? It's not dealing with steric hindrance, right? These are planar. These are far apart. Uh, carbon with that uh, methoxide group and the aldehyde group, that doesn't matter that carbon six is closer to carbon two. Um, what is really important about the regioselectivity is considering the charge distributions between the diene and the dienophile. So what do we have to look for? Resonance. And we have to look at the resonance hybrid in order to truly understand how these atoms come together. So looking at our diene, we have resonance where that oxygen group can come and put a negative charge on carbon number one. Let's go ahead and count here. One, two, three, four. Putting a negative charge on carbon number one. So we could think about that resonance hybrid between the interaction of the substituent and one of the alkenes of the diene as this, all right? So it's important to note that delta minus charge. Now we do know that dienophiles tend to uh, react better with electron withdrawing groups. Um, and so that's why uh, we will draw the resonance structure that involves that electron withdrawing group. And again, I'm gonna label this five and six, right? Five and six. So the resonance hybrid with this oxygen of the aldehyde puts a delta plus on our carbon five. Again, I'm just numbering to, to be able to discuss, right? And I typically number them this way. Now, what we wanna be able to do is consider that the locate locations of the partial charges and then the attractive forces between them would probably want to bring these two carbons together. And so that's what we technically see happen. The delta minus and the delta plus of the diene and the dienophile are the most likely to join together. They're little magnets and they want to be together. All right, so that's how we can start to think about the regio selectivity of this reaction. Uh, this only needs to be considered when both the diene and the dienophile are not symmetrical. Okay, if one of these was symmetrical, we don't need to deal with this. It doesn't matter how you number, just throw the guys together in the cycloaddition. If both of them are asymmetrical, though, you do need to consider the regio selectivity.